Welcome back to the program analysis course and to this second part of the lecture on data flow analysis. So in the very first video of data flow analysis, we've seen an example of a data flow analysis, namely the available expression analysis. And what I want to do in this video is to explain the basic principles underlying this whole idea of data flow analysis and for which you've already seen um, an example in the first video. So here's just briefly again an outline of this whole lecture. Um, we have now already done um, this first video and now we are here in the second video where I'm going to talk about these basic ideas that are valid for every data flow analysis, including the available expression analysis that you've seen earlier. In order to define a data flow analysis, there are six important properties. And in a sense, you just have to remember these six properties because everything else is derived from these six properties. So a data flow analysis is defined at first by a domain. So the domain is basically telling us what kind of information the analysis is reasoning about and what is the analysis state that the analysis tries to propagate through the program. Then every data flow analysis has a direction, which basically tells us whether it's a forward or a backward analysis, so whether it reasons about the code in the order in which um, statements are actually executed, or by reasoning about the code backwards, which for some analysis problems makes more sense than a forward reasoning. Next, we also um, have to define a transfer function for every data flow analysis, which you've already seen in the first video um, through an example. Um, basically defines what happens if the analysis reaches a particular statement. How does the analysis state change when the statement um, is considered by the analysis? Then we'll have to define a meet operator, which basically tells us what happens if the flow of control merges or if you're reasoning backward um, when there is a, a branch. So it um, tells us what happens if there are two incoming two or more incoming statements that need to be somehow combined by the analysis to um, propagate the information. Um, then you always have to define the boundary condition, which is about what happens um, when you do not know anything else. So for example, this could be to assume you have an empty set of whatever you're reasoning about, or you have the maximal um, um, possible set um, of whatever you're reasoning about. We'll see what exactly this means in a few seconds. And then you also have to define um, the initial values telling us, for example, what happens in case you enter a piece of code. Um, so what is the set of information that the analysis starts with? Let's now look into these six properties in some more detail and let's get started with the domain. So what the data flow analysis does is to compute some kind of information at every point in your program, or more specifically at the entry and exit of every statement in your program. When we say information, what this basically means is that we want to compute a set of things at each program point. And this, uh, all these sets that we will compute at each program point are some subset of a larger set. And this larger set is called the domain of the analysis. So the domain of the analysis is basically contains all the possible elements that a set at a particular program point may have. For the example analysis that we've already seen, so for the available expressions analysis, this domain of the analysis is the set of all non-trivial expressions. So all the non-trivial expressions that occur somewhere in the program are in the possible set of available expressions that we may see at the different points in the program. And what the analysis then does is to compute the right subset for every um, program point. The second property of a data flow analysis is about the direction. And as I've already briefly mentioned, this is basically about whether the analysis propagates information along the control flow graph following the direction of the edges as we normally see them in the control flow graph. And in this case, the analysis is called a forward analysis because it just propagates information forward um, along the normal flow of control. In contrast, an analysis can also be a backwards analysis which essentially means that you take the control flow graph and then invert all actions. So you just turn them around. And um, that means that the analysis is reasoning about executions in reverse. So it's, um, you can think of it, it's starting at the end of the program and then going backwards in order to compute whatever the analysis wants to compute. We'll see examples of backward analyses um, in 
uh, a later video, but for the example that you have already seen, the available expressions analysis, this was actually a forward analysis because we started at the entry um, node of our control flow graph and then follow the control flow edges in the normal direction until um, we reached the end of the um, code that was to be analyzed. Property number three of a data flow analysis is the transfer function. So what this transfer function is doing is to define how a statement affects the information that is propagated by the analysis. And the way this is written down is by basically writing down an equation that tells us what the state of the analysis is at the exit of a statement, given um, what we know at the beginning of the statement and maybe some other information. So in general, um, for a particular uh, or for, yeah, for any kind of data flow analysis, so df here means data flow analysis, the um, uh, transfer function tells us about the state at the exit of a statement s by defining some function um, of um, df entry of s, so basically the state of the analysis at the entry of the statement s. Now this is the most general way to, to put this transfer function. We have already seen um, the example of the available expression analysis where we had defined um, the transfer function as follows. So in this case we say ae for available expression and we say that at the exit of a statement s um, what we know is what we have known at the beginning of the statement, um, so ae entry of s and then we remove everything that is defined by this helper function called kill and then afterwards add um, new elements to our resulting set by adding everything that is in um, gen of s where gen of s is this other helper function um, that tells us what a statement s is generating. In principle you do not have to define the transfer function based on a kill set and a generate set but in practice for most data flow analyses this is the most natural way to define the transfer function. So you'll very often see this kind of um, definition where it's whatever we have at the entry minus whatever the statement kills plus whatever is generated by the statement. Property number four of a data flow analysis is the so-called meet operator. So what the meet operator does is to answer that question here, which is, well, what if you have two statements S1 and S2 that flow to a statement S? What kind of information should we propagate? That's the question that is really asked here. And now depending on um, whether we are reasoning forward or backward, this question may come up in different kinds of situations. So if you have a forward analysis, then this question comes up whenever the execution branches merge again. So for example, if you have an if somewhere and the execution is branching, then at some point the then branch and the else branch will merge again and will reach. And this is where this question comes up. So oh, what, what, what kind of information do we take? The information from the then branch or the information from the else branch. If we reason about the code in a backward analysis, then the same question comes up already at the branching point. For example, if you have an if and reason backwards, then at the branching point, um, the two branches come together and we need to say what information to propagate from the two branches as or from the two statements that are incoming, um, namely S1 and S2. Now the meet operator defines what to do in this case and there are two um, common answers to do this, um, which is set union and set intersection. So in the union case, we're basically saying that um, whatever um, we have at the entry of um, a statement S is what we have at the exit of one of the incoming statements S1 and then the union of this with whatever we have at the exit of the other incoming statement S2. So we just take both um, these two sets and put them together as a union. And then um, the other option is to compute the intersection. So this looks very similar. In this case, we say whatever we have at the entry of statement S is only what is in the intersection of what we have at the exit of statement S1 and at the exit of statement S2. So only elements that occur in both branches are considered in that case. For the um, available expressions analysis, um, we had taken the second option, intersection, simply because we can only say that an expression is definitely available if it is available on both um, incoming um, statements. Let's move on to property number five of a data flow analysis, which is about the so-called boundary condition. So what the boundary condition defines is what kind of information to actually start with at the first node of the control flow graph that we are considering. 
So what this first node is depends on whether we are looking at the forward analysis or a backward analysis. In case of a forward analysis, um, the first node is the entry node of the control flow graph, so the one that we have at the very beginning. And in case of a backward analysis, because we start at the end, the first node is actually the exit node of the control flow graph. So usually the point in the execution where the function um, has uh, finished its execution. Now, in order to um, define what information to start with at this control flow graph node, um, you can in principle define um, any subset of the domain of the analysis. But um, what typically happens is that you either define it as the empty set, which is what we did for the available expressions analysis, right? Um, or you can define it as the entire domain, uh, so the entire domain of the analysis, where you say, well, we start with the full set, and then uh, sometimes we are removing things when we are visiting um, the, the individual statements. And then finally, property number six of a data flow analysis are the initial values, which basically tell us um, what information to start with at the intermediate nodes. So when um, you start propagating um, the analysis state, um, when you reach a node that you haven't seen before, you need to start with some set as the current analysis state of this statement. And again, there are two typical choices. Either you take the empty set or you take the entire domain of the analysis. And the empty set is what we had done for the available expressions analysis, because before we have really thought about a statement, we cannot really assume that any of the expressions is available. So we start with the empty set here. So just to wrap this up, um, here are the six properties again. And here you can also see how we had defined them for the available expressions analysis. So the domain is the set of all non-trivial expressions. The direction is forward because the available expressions analysis reasons um, in a forward manner about the code. Um, the transfer function is defined as you see here. So it takes whatever um, is the entry state of a statement, removes everything that is killed and then adds everything that is generated by the statement. Um, as the meet operator, we had said union makes most sense because otherwise we cannot be sure that an expression is really available. Um, we start by saying that at the very beginning of the control flow graph, um, the um, set is empty because we do not know what um, expressions are available and the same for initializing the um, sets of intermediate nodes. All right, and that's already the end of video number two on data flow analysis. So you have now seen the basic principles of data flow analysis, namely these six properties that are defining a data flow analysis. And what we'll do in the next video is to actually look at more examples and other kinds of data flow analysis um, that all um, are defined by defining these six properties and then look at different static analysis problems than the example that you've seen so far. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.